God, laying your majesty aside. You reach down in love to show me life. Lifted from darkness into light. Oh, King for a slave, trading your righteousness for shame. Despite all my pride and foolish ways, caught in your infinite embrace. Theology is the study of God. So theology of the body is the study of God in and through our body. Now, how can we learn anything about God? We have to remember that before God came, before Jesus came, God was there. God who was pure spirit. So God who was pure spirit creates humanity, and he wants to reveal himself to humanity. But as we know, as physical beings, God is pure spirit, so we might not necessarily right away be able to, we won't be able to pick up necessarily through the senses. So God who is pure spirit wanted to reveal himself and communicate himself to us physical beings. And how do us physical beings learn things? We, of course, learn things in and through the senses. We hear, we taste, we touch, we smell. These physical realities, sensual realities, great, get transmitted through our senses into our mind, and we learn. So God, who was pure spirit, wanted to reveal himself. So how does he do it? He does it through physical realities. Easy definition of a sacrament is a physical sign that reveals an invisible reality which transforming grace has passed through. Now, all the physical creation out there can reveal something about God. Take a beautiful starry night. To think that those stars are billions of light years away. That we're in one small solar system compared to this massive, never-ending universe. We're in a small planet compared to this massive, never-ending universe. If we could see God within the sky, within the universe, the universe itself reveals to us God's awesomeness, that He's huge, that He's infinite. The fact that the universe is infinite reveals to all of us that God is infinite. Because all of creation reveals something about God. But what part of creation is more beautiful than any starry night? What part of creation reveals the most about God? You and I. We've been made in the image and likeness of God.
There's a great privilege of being a director in a theater in that you have the opportunity to create what the world of the process will be like. So you invite in these actors that uh, you think both will serve the part well. It requires an emotional trust and a trust uh, with things in your past and a trust with things you're struggling with and a trust as well with, with beautiful things and taking ownership of, of goodness. As the director, and in this case as a playwright as well, um, I always feel that the actor goes into the world. As he goes deeper, it's my job to tether him back to reality um, and to sort of help him hold who he is versus who he's portraying. So for example, the first play that I directed, Salome by Oscar Wilde, which is about the beheading of John the Baptist, we had to go to some pretty dark places, places that I didn't feel comfortable going as a director. Um, sexual places, violent places, it was a very violent world that could behead a saint. And I was worried as well, working with, with my fellow students at the time, um, not to lead them into anything pernicious. There's sort of two ways an actor can approach a, a very serious role, a very demanding role. One is you go in and you learn something about yourself and it's something that you want to bring back. A positive, emulative experience. My Hamlet actually reconnected with his real dad in real life because he took on the burden of, of dealing with this guy who had lost his father. Um, my Romeo, who was being played by a 14-year-old, practice what it is to have to grow up really fast and take responsibility, and that affected him. My Kate, who was a woman um, who usually got the comical roles, by the end of it, I mean, she is just beautiful, and she's strong, and yet feminine, all of it, and desirable, and queenly. She had the opportunity in this world that told her, I'm sorry, you're just not cute enough, to embrace all her majesty and to take that back into the world. These experiences happen all the time, all the time on the stage. I myself have, you know, Festy the Jester, Rosalind from As You Like It have been hugely transformative to me as a person, as an actor. Um, and then you also have the negative ones like Herod. Not that it's a negative experience, but in those cases you pinpoint what you are capable of and do not want to pursue because you have the opportunity on stage to say, this is where this behavior leads, and I know it now, and now I can avoid it. Sit, sit, stay, sit, I 
cannot kill thee twice. Let alone you just have the opportunity to tell great and true and beautiful and powerful and difficult and, and honest. And one of my actresses recently called the work we're doing soul restoring work and bring it to life with sympathy and yet also providing hope. We have an obligation, I feel, even if it's just for an instant in our, uh, in this case, theatrical work, but whatever work it may be, to show there is hope, there is another choice, there is something beautiful and something more, and you are not enslaved. I hope that I'm able to bring you know, my experiences to each character that, that I do. I think that that's what's wonderful about um, seeing different actors play different roles uh, or because everyone's experiences are so different. I can only bring what I know to, to be true to a character and try to you know, connect their lives to, to moments in my own that I can relate to and, and then bring a truth to the character. It may not, you know, it may not be you know, what someone else would do, but that's okay. That's the beauty of, of being actors and being able to, to bring your own truth to something. You know, for me, that's so important to you know, to be as honest to a character. And, and a lot of times in shows when you are recreating a, a role that someone has done before, it's very difficult to, to sometimes bring your own truth because a director or a company is used to seeing someone else do it and, you know, what they would do. But I'm like, I'm not that person. I can try to, you know, I don't want to change because it's working. You know, you, you want to honor what the original company has done, but at the same time, it is important to somehow insert your own truth into that, you know, into that mold. to me is one of the most human of all the arts because unlike novel writing or um, painting a picture, it requires other people. And unlike performing music, it requires as well the input of other people in the moment. So that every act of theater, although you're working off the same blueprint, is absolutely new because it's created by all the individuals coming together to form this small community for just a short period of time to tell a story, to tell a truth. And uh, it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I'm in theater especially is because while movies also do that, there isn't a live audience. You, when you're in the theater, you're speaking directly to someone you have the opportunity to change a life in that moment. And I've been privileged enough with several of the shows that I've directed where someone will come up afterwards and say, 
that piece absolutely changed my life or I am rethinking about my marriage and I'm going to have a discussion with my husband. I, I, I've realized something about how I've been behaving and um, it's humbling because it's not, you know, I mean, you aim for it, but it's God who works through you as with, with any motion, with any um, sacramental. That I will not, nor I cannot love. You were better quit of me than ever fall in love with me. I am not what I am, nor feel I the mortals feel. The wind blows strangely. Come, let's away. Why should we leave? We dare not stay. And you as well, dear mother. I would do this deed alone. So to this day she dies. Remember, son, my vengeance. Fail me not. When have I ever failed you? At the beginning of, of creating a piece of music, it's, it's very much just me and the piano and very little direct thought. Um, when I'm in that kind of state, I'm thinking more in terms of, of visual images rather than uh, kind of thoughts that, that could be easily spelled out in words. Um, but then when I kind of go into what I've, that, that raw material and then start taking elements of it and say like, here's this could be a good main theme, this could be a good bridge, um, or this could be a, a, a verse or chorus, if, if it's that kind of music. Um, and then I start putting that structure together and thinking about it more consciously and deliberately. That's when I start kind of thinking about, well, who's the audience for this? Um, what, what sort of genre of music is appropriate or what musical influences do I want to sort of accentuate or, or maybe remove depending on what the, the intention of the particular piece is or whether it's uh, for a piece of theater, for one of, of my own albums or some other project. Um, that's kind of, that, that starts to come in sort of, yeah, in like the medium, the, the middle stage when I start figuring out the, the process. <laughs> There's just a, a force in the universe that is, um, to me, a, a f alive, um, but not, not really a, a being that one can interact with in the, the same way that one speaks to a person, but it's this, it's this kind of energy that one can sort of channel um, as an artist. So um, I wouldn't really state it as directly as God creating through people or, or inspiring people directly. It's more that people who create art, um, some forms of art, uh, can sort of open themselves up to uh, that sort of force in the universe and let it flow through them. But it's, it's, never, it's never just that pure uh, energy from the universe. Whoever you are, your own experiences and past and mentality are also going to have just as much of an effect on, on what comes out as, as, th as whatever is coming into you. So it's always kind of a, a blend and there's always, um, 
different attributes. But I, I think there's also some people who make art um, without that um, intention. If they're um, if if someone is creating something more for like just purely for a commercial purpose, that might not be an element of it, or, or sometimes it might. But I think both forms exist. Creating music is, is also uh, a, a very emotional um, and, and kind of spiritual process for me. I have a very um, improvisational approach. Um, when, I, when I start a, uh, a project, I generally don't um, think, first I don't think in terms of structure or um, aspect of any aspect of, of theory or chord progression or anything like that. Usually. Um, the first thing I do is I sit down at the piano and just kind of close my eyes and improvise. Um, so that's how it was with this project. Um, when when Mayan first approached me with the idea and, and we kind of discussed what our sort of influences would be in, in terms of um, the subject matter and, and themes and also kind of outside influences we, we would draw from uh, mythologies and so on. Um, and I would just kind of focus on these things while um, while playing piano pieces and just record these improvisations and then later go back and uh, kind of narrow down sections of, of recorded improvisations and, and turn those into uh, pieces that eventually became the pieces in the work. And, and that was sort of the process throughout was um, working with Mayan and also with uh, Marnie Breckenridge, uh, the vocalist, and uh, with, with Christopher Chen who wrote the libretto. Um, we would uh, throughout the, the first couple of months we were working on the project get kind of more and more specific in terms of what's happening in, in this moment and what are the songs and I would just kind of repeat that process of, um, of improvising and then narrowing down moments within those improvisations. Nothing compares to this love 